Hello everyone, welcome to this evening's webinar. My name is Tim Cole, I'm the UK Clinical Affairs Manager and joining me this e evening as always is my, my colleague Emily Malburn. She's um, in one of the boxes next to me. Emily is our um, Academy uh, Manager and the Marketing Manager of Heidelberg UK. Um, and it's our pleasure this evening to be introducing to, to this evening Professor Farouk Ganji. Farouk is a, an ophthalmologist based up in Bradford, and he's going to be talking to us this evening about OCT and geography spe specifically, and its role in identifying uh, neovascularization in age-related macular degeneration. And before I just hand you over to uh, to the prof, I just want to do a little bit of, of my bit, just to explain how the thing's going to go this evening. Um, Farouk's obviously doing his, his main talk, but as he's going along this evening, we do really encourage you to submit your questions, as many as you can possibly think of. And if you're new to this uh, platform with GoTo, if you're using the desktop PC to view this, there's a question mark in a bubble that you can click on and then type in your message, uh, your questions to us. If you're using an iPad, it's just a question mark and same with a mobile phone, just hit that question mark and type in your questions. And then at the end, I'll pop back um, with Emily and we'll read out your questions and, and get some uh, some interesting answers off Farouk, I'm sure. So I'm going to I'm going to now pass over to Em. She's got a message for you about um, the CET points and the uh, and the points, what you need to do to get those. But yeah, thank you very much, Farouk and uh, Emily. I'll pass on to you. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, just a note to say that um, this is this webinar is CPD accredited. So that's through the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. Um, and you will get a certificate for your attendance. Um, and that'll come about one hour in an automated email after the webinar ends. So as long as you're here and you've attended, you'll get a certificate. Um, but that's all from me. And I'll hand over to uh, Professor Ganchi now and let him take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Tim, Emily, and the Heidelberg Academy for asking me to talk to you tonight about the use of OCT and OCTA in particular in identifying the CNV in patients with macular degeneration. Um, OCT has been around for a long time and it has become part of our uh, usual clinical practice. Um, going forwards, uh, is going to be the technology that's going to help us both in our clinics um, here uh, as well as in remote situation like virtual clinics. So OCT in AMD we have been using for a long time. In our practice has been there for almost uh, 15 plus years uh, with the um, period domain OCT that we used before and now the spectral domain OCTs. But when it comes to using it in the cases of AMD, there are certain biomarkers that we need to identify. So I'm going to start with the biomarkers that we can see on the OCT first before we move on to the OCTA. So drusen, for example, that's a marker for the AMD in general, especially the dry form. So if you see drusen in both eyes, that helps you to clinch the diagnosis of AMD rather than non-AMD macular degenerative changes. So it's important to look at the drusen. And then we all know about the fluid, the presence of fluid demarcates the change into the wet macular degeneration. There are various fluid compartments that we talk about, such as intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, and sub-IPE fluid as well. Atrophy doesn't count that much when we talk about the wet macular degeneration. Nonetheless, it's important for uh, the prognosis for visual function long term. Along with the fluid, there are other markers for wet macular degeneration, such as hyperreflective material. Look at the ellipsoid layer, that is the indicative marker for the health of the photoreceptors. And of course, the pigment epithelium, we want to see whether it's detached or not, whether there's any atrophy or not, that would help us in prognosticating. Uh, the patient's outcome later on. We also need to start thinking about the region of interest, and it is not the macular or extramacular retina, it's the three dimensional retina we're talking about here. Which layer of the retina where we have problem with the fluid, the 
changes of exudation, uh, hemorrhage, so on and so forth. So, as I mentioned, for the diagnostic biomarkers for the wet macular degeneration, there are a couple of things which are really obvious here on the slide, such as the fluid, which is subretinal, the star, as well as intraretinal fluid or intraretinal cyst. Along with that, there is this denomination that is used now as subretinal hyperreflective material, that is the HRM. It can be well defined or poorly defined, and poorly defined one is known as also known as she or subretinal hyperreflective exudation. So these are the markers that tell you that this patient potentially has wet macular degeneration. And when you use other technologies, which we're going to talk about, the OCTA, it helps you to identify the network of blood vessels or the blood flow pattern in the retina. I've always pointed out in various talks that I've given uh, over the years is that it's not only the retina that you should be paying attention. Look at the choroid under the retina as well. And we have increasingly come to know about the condition called pachychoroid. It's a spectrum of diseases within that. And that's why it's important to look at your choroid along with your retinal layers that you would normally assess. There are certain biomarkers that I'm sure we all know, uh, and we're going to come to know about even more biomarkers as we learn from looking at the OCTs that we have in the clinics. Retinal thickness is the first one that we realized was useful, and it has been used in various clinical trials, such as looking at submacular or macular retinal thickness, macular volume. And as I mentioned recently, we're talking about the fluid compartments and the amount of fluid within that compartments, whether it is subfovial or extrafovial, intraretinal, subretinal, or sub IPE. There are other markers that we need, to be, we need to be paying attention, such as fibrosis. Fibrosis appears on the OCT scan as very well defined hyperreflective material in subretinal space. If you see retinal tubules in the outer retina, that is indicative of a chronic change. And I'll show you an example or two. As I said, there's more uh, interest these days in finding the retinal fluid in which compartment it is and segmentation of those areas, uh, either manually or using the machine learning as in this example. As I mentioned previously, fluid has been used as a marker and for adjusting the treatments, both treating at the time and treatment intervals is based on the fluid presence of fluid and how quickly it resolves and comes back. There is a new concept that is coming in, uh, in, in certain sectors at least, which is to find out what is the tolerance for fluid. And it's been said that you people can tolerate, that is the clinicians can tolerate, uh, subretinal fluid more than the intraretinal fluid. That remains uh, a subject for debate at some other time. However, it's important to recognize there are various fluid compartments that behave differently when you treat patients with wet macular degeneration. Um, some prognostic markers here. So in this example, you see that the sub-RPE space, which is the, the spindle, uh, the pigment epithelial detachment has got kind of a layers within them. And that indicates a chronicity of that pigment epithelium detachment. You have a broken uh, ISOS junction or ellipsoidal layer here, as well as broken uh, external limiting membrane. That is a poor prognostic sign in such cases. So just to highlight the difference between subretinal hyperreflective material which is the red diamond in the top OCT scan here. Or you can say that it is a well-defined SRAM. But when the patient comes back for follow-up, as you can see, there is a new pigment epithelial detachment, which is the star. Along with that, the blue arrow points out the new exudation in that, that is increase in subretinal hyperreflective area. And there are some intraretinal cysts as well. So that shows there is a new activity in patients with geographic atrophy 
And if you look at the color picture on the side, there is a small uh, retinal hemorrhage as well that can be seen. So it's important to, to pay attention to these little changes from time to time that happens in our patients. Pigmentary epithelial detachments can be of various types, and it's important to pay attention to them as well. So the top is just a drusenoid pigment epithelial detachment. It's quite solid looking with hyperreflectivity within that drusen, while the bottom one shows kind of a cystic appearance of that pigment epithelial detachment. And if you look at the pigment epithelial detachment on the left-hand side on the bottom OCT scan, it's kind of a double notched PED. The undulating PEDs that you see within the center of the scan is quite characteristic of um, potential harboring CNV within that. So it's important to pay attention to that configuration as well. Um, we have recognized that in some patients you see some hyperreflective dots within the retina, intraretinal uh, space, along with intraretinal fluid. And if you stop treating the patient if the intraretinal fluid improves, but they have these dense particles, it's indicative that the patient would get the recurrence of fluid later on. So when you see these intraretinal dense particles, it's important to recognize them as a feature prognostic for progression of wet macular degeneration. And it's important to treat those patients as well. The other important uh, marker that I want to point out here is which is less paid attention to is the pigment epithelial detachment. If you look at the height of the pigment epithelial detachment on the top left-hand side, after the injection of ranibizumab, that pigment epithelial detachment also flattens along with the fluid improvement. But when the recurrence takes place, you find that the pigment epithelial detachment has again increased in size. That shows that the CNV that sits under the pigment epithelial detachment is still active. What about the changes which, which present themselves uh, after a long period of time of treatment? Sometimes they can be mistaken as intraretinal cysts, such as outer retinal tubulation here in the middle. There are signs of volume compression here as if the outer retina sorry, the inner retina has collapsed onto the outer retina. That is not a sign of disease activity, but it is in fact a collapse of the outer retina, a structural change. The subretinal thickening, that is the scar. So just coming back to the clinical picture that you need for diagnosis of wet macular degeneration. Hemorrhage, of course, a macular hemorrhage should trigger that suspicion that the patient has wet macular degeneration. Exudation, obviously a marker for some fluid leakage in the macula, so that should also trigger uh, suspicion. An OCT scan itself would confirm that there is uh, SREM, there is subretinal fluid, and the pigment epithelial detachment, intraretinal edema, all the features as we have described on OCT biomarkers for wet macular degeneration. So before I go on to talk about the OCT angiography, I just want to take you through what we used to do before we had the OCT angiography, which was the standard uh, fluorescein angiogram or the dye angiography. In Bradford, we used to use both fluorescein and ICG angiography together. Um, and here are some examples of our clinical cases. Just to recap on what CNV looks like on fluorescein angiograms and how we describe them. So here's the first case, the ICG image first. And on the left, we have a fluorescein image. ICG gives you much better definition of the CNV uh, as the ICG does not leak out of the vessels. While the fluorescein, which is on the left, it starts fluorescing early and then that leaks. And that is something that we described as a classic CNV. Classic CNV is a CNV that grows above the RPE. So that is type 2 CNV, in other words. Here is another example. Patient has a um, large PED in subretinal fluid, SREM, on the OCT scan that we have descri described earlier. And the fluorescein angiogram along with the ICG shows that there is early hyperfluorescence. 
in part of the lesion. That's the bottom left part of the macula. And as you can see, that lesion also hyperfluoresces, increasing in intensity and size with time. But it's only part of the lesion that is hyperfluorescing at that stage. In later stages, you can see there is stippled hyperfluorescence on fluorescent image on the left of the whole area. So then we describe that kind of fluorescent pattern as a minimally classic, where you had the CNB in both sub RP space and also above the IP or in the subretinal space. The third example, you have a large pigment epithelial detachment seen on the OCT scan. Color picture shows a small hemorrhage in the inferior macula. Again, a telltale sign suspicious for wet macular degeneration. And here is the fluorescent angiogram along with the ICG. Um, and obviously, I'm showing you some of the best examples that we, we had in the clinical practice. Not all the clinical pictures have been this good. In this particular case, you can see the hyperfluorescence is limited to very tiny area in the bottom part of the macula on the fluorescent angiogram on the left-hand side. So this was an example of minimally classic or predominantly occult membrane. What it means is most of the CNB was under the RPE, only a small part had broken through and gone into the subretinal space. So in good old days, when we had PDT as the standard for treatment for wet macular degeneration, we used to do fluorescent angiograms regularly at baseline and every three months after the treatment. And that helped us to figure out what the treatment response was. And we had to classify the CNVs, whether it was classic, predominantly classic, minimally classic, or occult. It's an old hat now because we have some newer technologies. So the question is, do we still need retinal angiogram? And the short answer is yes, but not the dye angiogram as a default. Because if you look at the OCT scans, in most of the cases, it is still possible just based on the OCT biomarkers for CNV, such as the SREM, subretinal hyperreflective material, subretinal fluid, intraretinal fluid, to come to a conclusion that this patient has wet macular degeneration. And if you do a fluorescent angiogram, you would find a CNV in those sort of cases. But that is not 100% specific, that test that is the OCT. And hence, we need something extra to confirm that there are some macular new vessels under the, mac, under the retina. So to do that, we need to remember that the retina is arranged in various layers and know those layers inside out. Um, in cases of wet macular degeneration, we are interested in the outer retina. That is finding out where your barrier layer is between your choroid and retina. That is these three hyperreflective lines that you see in this normal OCT scan. That's composed of your Brooks membrane, um, RP, and your interdigitation layer between the RP and photoreceptors. The brightest white line is your ISOS junction or ellipsoidal layer, as we know. And the faintest white line on top of that is the external limiting membrane. So most of the pathology for uh, CNV and macular degeneration takes place in the outer retina around this area because the pathology comes from the choroid and grows into the retina. So for understanding the OCT angiography, we also need to understand the anatomy, the vascular anatomy of the retina. And Emily has said that she's going to share this with you on one of the handouts. So it's very useful to remember. The retina is supplied by the retinal circulation. So you have the larger retinal arteries and venules in the nerve fiber layer. And then you have the superficial plexus, as we described, uh, and the deeper plexus that is going up to uh, the nuclear layer and out to plexiform layer. When we talk about the wet macular degeneration, these are not affected as such except for the type 3 CNV, and we'll refer to that. And type 3 CNV is your 
retinal angiometrous proliferation. So that has the pathology that goes into your deeper retinal plexus and then goes down to the choroidal layers as well in some cases. So for our purpose, we are interested in what happens in the choriocapillaris region and retinal avascular zone, which is outside your outer plexiform layer up to your Brooks and hyperreflective bands in the outer retina. Now, we're talking about the Heidelberg today, but if you have access to the other OCT platforms, you need to remember the segmentation boundaries can be slightly different and you need to pay attention to that as well. OCT angiography, the principle is that you get lots and lots of OCT scans, the B scans, in quick succession. Basically, then you feed that information to your computer that's going to use the mathematical algorithms to figure out where the movement in the retina has been. So things that move are left behind and things that are static are taken away. So that gives you a map of retinal vasculature. Uh, not only that, but anything else that moves within the retina, for example, the fluid with some movement sometimes can give you an artifact as well. So remember, all you see hyperreflective uh, pattern on OCT angiography tells you that there has been movement in that part. And what we take for granted is most of the movement in the retina is the movement of red cells. And hence, we have the map of the vascular network both healthy and unhealthy or pathological. So when it comes to using OCTA in macular degeneration, it's been around for quite a few years now, and it's used in diagnosis of wet macular degeneration, which is what I'll be talking about over the next 15, 20 minutes. Um, so it, it can help us to identify the phenotypes of the CNVs that we see, the morphology, where it, it lies in the context of the retina and how it changes with your treatment as well. That is the useful aspect in the management. However, my talk today is focused primarily on the diagnosis of uh, wet macular degeneration, especially identifying the CNV. So we were fortunate enough to pull together a team of um, retina experts in UK uh, a few years ago when we did our first uh, study or use it in, using OCT angiography and its clinical application in a few centers, about seven centers in UK. Um, it was early uh, version of the OCT angiography modules that we had. And the aim of the study was to find out how acceptable it would be for our patients. Um, what it helped us to do was to set up the criteria for OCT angiography, and we used multimodal imaging as a part of the OCT imaging protocol. We had two OCT angiography scans, both 10 by 10, uh, but one was high definition, the other one was a medium resolution to figure out which one was quicker to access uh, for the patient's uh, acceptability point of view. Um, there was not much difference whether it was a high definition scan because the time taken was similar between the two, not that high for the high definition scans. So all the patients that we had scanned with the OCTA, uh, almost all but one had said that they were very happy to, to support the widespread use of OCT angiography in favor of OCT angiography compared to the standard dye angiography. Um, we continued our experience of using OCTA in clinical practice. And then we thought that it is better to put it to test really whether it is a technology that can be used by anybody and everybody in the clinics. And this paper was published in I earlier this year um, in print version. So we had looked at using the OCT angiography in our routine practice for patient presenting uh, or referred to us with suspected CNV. So we had no idea what the patients had at the time, but the patients had the standard OCT scan and OCT angiography as well as the dye angiography. We recruited a uh, few people to be part of this study. And when I say few people, that is clinicians. So one was an optometrist, one was a retinal fellow and a consultant. 
And all the three were masked to what the patient's diagnosis was, whether that was a CNV or no CNV. All they were told was the patient was referred for a possible wet macular degeneration change. And they were asked to look at the OCT angiography. And we, at the time, as I said, it was the earlier version of the OCT angiography uh, software as well. So we said we want to use the automated segmentation of the OCT angiography module and figure out if you can see uh, CNV on on fast image of the OCT angiography. At the same time, we said we would allow you to use a manual segmentation and use that segmentation line through the outer retina, so avascular zone, as well as the courier capillaries, and see if you can identify CNV through that manual uh, method. And finally, we asked them to consider OCT scans, as I mentioned, the biomarkers, as they see if there were biomarkers for retromacular degeneration, and along with that, use the OCTA and figure out if you can find the CNV or not. So again, to point out those biomarkers, we specifically asked for subretinal hyperreflective material, the SHREM, and the double layer sign, which is what you see in the pigment epithelial detachment, you see what appears to be the Brooks membrane underneath intact. And that is uh, identified as a biomarker uh, for polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy based on earlier reports. So we wanted to figure out whether that can be used as a marker for a potential CNV in that space. And here are some pictures from our paper. And what it shows is how we identified the CNV. So the, we relied on picking up the CNV on on fast image, which is on the top right corner here under the blue square. And we used the standard software uh, telling us whether there was a CNV in avascular complex or not. So if you look at on your um, screens here on the left hand side, you have the various slabs that the software has included in the Heidelberg HiX or HiX2 system. So we, we use the avascular complex, which is the outer retina. But as the example shows here, we allowed the manual segmentation uh, ourselves or using a slab manually, which is the left uh, panel again. But at the bottom, you have an option of uh, advanced uh, method where you can choose your reference line need to be at basement membrane. And you have user-defined box at the bottom where you say we want a thickness lab about 40 microns. And that gives you these two red lines, which is on the OCT scan image, the B scan image uh, on the left-hand side. Those two red lines tell you where the slab is coming from. And the image that is displayed on the on fast window on the top right hand tells you that there was a CNV present in this slab for this particular example. So we used all those uh, methods as a part of our, our project, and we found that it was possible to identify CNV both on on fast images with automated segmentation, but it was slightly better with manual segmentation. But when you combine those on fast images along with your OCT image, as it is in the top right uh, middle picture, that gives you more indication and more help to confirm that there is a presence of CNV. And two extra images I've got here, the color picture, which we did not use for our study, but so that certainly helps in clinical practice. If you see a hemorrhage, that's another marker that you can use. And a fluorescent angiogram we used for this study to confirm as a gold standard against which we confirm whether the presence or absence as we marked for the study was right or not. And our results were quite striking. We found that even on um, automated segmentation, which wasn't perfect with that software version, the sensitivity and specificity were really high. Specificity was 91%. But we found that it was much better if you use a combination of both the SDOCT, the biomarkers that I mentioned, along with the OCTA, and that gives you about 90%, uh, roughly 90% sensitivity and specificity for OCTA in diagnosis that 
uh, CNV in a treatment naive cohort of patients that we had seen. And we have shared that paper with you so you can look at it in more detail. So I'm going to share some examples now, clinical examples of various CNVs that you would see. And here I'll start with type one. If you remember on the fluorescein angiogram, good old days, we used to call them occult CNV because this is sub RPE um, CNV. So if you look at the OCT scan here, there's hardly any fluid in the retina, but there is that shallow pigment epithelial detachment with the double layer sign. And the OCT scan that goes through has shown, and this is this lab in the choriocapillaris layer. If you look at the OCTA scan with the B scan with the overlap of the yellow dots, which is the bottom right picture, you find that the on fast image clearly shows a network of blood vessels in that area. So this confirmed type 1 CNV, or MNV as, as it is called, the macular knee vessels, but there was no exudation. So this is called non-exudative macular knee vessels. It's been stated that up to 30% of occult CNVs can be non-exudative, and they remain stable over a period of time. So not that all the CNVs or MNVs need treatment. An example of type 2, and here is a confirmatory fluorescein angiogram. Just go through what we have been talking about on the OCT scan first, which is the bottom right-hand pictures. Uh, it shows the area of subretinal hyperreflective material, subretinal fluid, intraretinal edema. The, I'd like to point out the, the, the flow map, which is the yellow dots that you see on the OCT scan superimposed, it shows that in the area of SREM, you have those yellow dots superimposed. So what the computer then does, it, 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 it provides the on fast map of that blood flow, which is the top right-hand picture. So standard three windows that you would see on the OCT angiography when you, when you look at it on HIEX software, it gives you a map of the superficial vascular network, deep vascular network, which is the middle one, and the avascular zone in which you see this vascular, abnormal vascular network, and which is type 2 CNV. And the fluorescein angiogram confirms that it was mainly classic CNV type 2. And the OCTA, if you superimpose, correlates so well. If anything, it provides you with a much higher definition, well, better contrast image of that vascular network. Um, there are various names that are used to describe the types of CNV. Here is an ex another example of type C2 CNV, uh, which is easily picked up on that uh, outer retina um, to inner choroidal junction. This was both type 2 and type 1 CNV. This was a patient with so-called CSR. So important thing I'm trying to point out here is the slab, which is the, yellow, the red, red triangle on the bottom left corner. If you move that slab up and down manually, that would change the picture of the CNV that you see on the top right on fast image, as you see there. So depending on where this lab is, you see the appearance of CNV change on the on fast slab. So it's a useful tool to use in your practice. Type 3 CNV, which is your wrap or retinal angiometrous proliferation, is difficult to pick up. Classically, if you have a clinical examination, you find a small hemorrhage, uh, intraretinal hemorrhage, that is, and the fluorescein angiogram shows very tiny area of leakage uh, intraretinally to start with, and that can progress into subretinal space as well. On OCTA, it is difficult to pick up the type 3 CNVs. This is because the flow within the CNV is vertical rather than horizontal. And hence, 
rather than using the on fast image, which is the top right, where you won't see the CNV, it is better to use the B scan with the overlapped flow images that show you the vertical flow pattern in the retina that confirms the diagnosis of RAP or retinal angiometrous proliferation type 3 CNV. If you're lucky and the flow is really fast and the RAP is big, as was in this case, it may be possible to see that on, on fast image as I've highlighted here in the yellow circle. But it's easier to pick up as a vertical flow on the B scan with your flow map uh, superimposed as in this case here. Polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy um, is another intriguing uh, condition. The flow within the polyp itself uh, varies. If you don't have any uh, network associated with the polyps themselves, because the flow within the polyp is very low flow velocity, it's difficult to pick up with the OCT angiography. It's better picked up with the uh, ICG angiography. Um, here's an example of uh, that patient where we had confirmed the polyps on ICG, but it was difficult to pick that flow up on OCT angiography. And as I said, uh, it's, it's because of the flow velocity mainly, but that could be the other issues of masking hemorrhage within the polyp or polyps that has self-involutive. So though we said our paper, in our paper, the sensitivity and specificity has been really high. Previous papers have put OCTA sensitivity quite high for type 1 CNV. Uh, but when you use combined OCT and OCTA, as we found, the sensitivity and specificity is much better. So some other case examples um, here, is a patient which has presented with a macular hemorrhage in the left eye, as you can see in the picture on the right-hand side of his skin. On the left-hand side, there were some macular pigmentary changes. And if you pay attention around the optic disc, you will find that the patient has a ribbon-like um, deeper red color radiating out of the optic disc, a feature that um, suggests the patient has edged streaks. And there are some angioid streaks here, that hypopigmented one, that grows across the macula on which we have seen this macular hemorrhage. So the OCT uh, scan shows you the pigment epithelial detachment. Um, there is that breach in the Brooks membrane as is characteristic of the angioid streaks. There is SREM, subretinal hyperreflective material, and intraretinal and uh, subretinal fluid. So when we did the fluorescent angiogram, it did not show any problem because of the masking probably, it did not show any trouble whatsoever. So when we did the OCT angiography, again, it doesn't show much of a problem on this on fast image, if you look at that, but now I presume you can tell that this retinal image, the on fast OCTA image, is not from the right area because it shows you deeper vascular plexus. We should be looking at much deeper layer of the retina on the OCT scan than that. And the proof is on your this segmentation lines. If you look at the bottom OCT scan pictures, it has come from your middle retina where you have deeper vascular plexus. I point out once again that if you look at the B scan with a map of overlap, overlapping of blood flow pattern, the yellow dots, you find that there are some yellow dots in the pigment epithelial detachment. So even without looking at the on fast, you can tell that there is abnormal flow in this area. So if you put the segmentation lines through the right area, here is going through the pigment epithelial detachment now to some extent, and it captures that yellow dots here, which is shown on the on fast as a possible network of blood flow vessels 
in the area at superior macula. Right? Now, as it happened, this patient's other eye um, had just pigment athelia detachments. When you do the OCTA scan, the flow map shows once again there are yellow dots. That's a flow pattern that has been picked up by this software within that pigment epithelial detachment. Don't look at the on fast image on its own because that can fool you. Because here, once again, that image has come from the superficial retina. So you're looking at the superficial vascular plexus, not the area of interest that I pointed out at the beginning of my talk. So when you go through the deeper retina, you have deeper vascular plexus, looks normal. But when you go in the outer retina sub RPE space, you find that there is that network of blood vessels that you can see now on on fast images as well quite clearly and that is once again your macular new vessels without exudation in the fellow eye of this patient and you can see those things in a number of patients that you may be seeing in your clinics you may be treating one eye for wet macular degeneration and they have shallow pigment epithelial detachment and this is the same patient. Uh, one week, one month later, there was exudation in the fellow eye. So it is important to pick up these changes. Now, if you were doing fluorescent angiogram, the dye angiogram, it would be difficult to pick up these changes. So easy with the OCT angiography that you can monitor these changes in your clinical practice quite readily. Now, just to show an interesting uh, case that has been in our clinic for some time, patient was diagnosed with um, central serous retinopathy years ago. And it's been coming for follow-up because he had some subretinal fluid, as you can see, on the OCT scan. Uh, the dye angiography did not show much of a leakage, though he had some steepled hyperfluorescence in the area. The ICG, that, that is the middle tops, uh, middle layer, uh, right picture, as you can see, an enlarged Corrado vessel. If you look at the enhanced depth OCT scan, you find that the patient has deep choroid. So it is a pachychoroid spectrum. If I point out to the OCT scan top right, you find that along with that subretinal fluid, patient has few areas of pigment epithelial detachment. Now, as it happens, we, we found our good old um, medical records, and the patient had fluorescent angiogram done some 25, 27 years ago. And it had shown the area of hyperfluorescence, which is corresponding to the area of hyperfluorescence we had seen on the fluorescent angiogram recently. So it seems that this patient's area of change in the macula had been present for almost 25 years. There was some in and out uh, subretinal fluid from time to time. Change in visual equity that would restore again spontaneously to the uh, maintenance level. So when you use the new technologies, that's the OCT angiography, it shows network of blood vessels in that part. And that network has remained unchanged over the last two or three years as well. So it seems that there are subgroup of patients which have been labeled as central serous retinopathy, which fall into the category of pachychoroid diseases. And here is a patient with pachychoroid neovasculopathy, where patient has not needed treatment, it spontaneously dissolves each time the fluid comes in. But we need to monitor them carefully, and the OCT angiogram provides that facility now to do that easily. So what about post-treatment uh, use of OCT angiography? And we have tried looking at it, and yes, it does show us that the OCTA can pick up the changes in the morphology of the CNV. So when the CNV is active, we see that they have frequent branching pattern at the tips of those vessels. And as they mature, they have what looks like a big trunk in the center of the CNV and the branching pattern at the tips become less pronounced, something that people describe as a mature CNV. 
with anti VEGF treatment. So CMVs stay in the macula, but they become mature with time and less uh, leaky. And people have used various terms to describe them as well. Uh, I don't think it helps um, in any way, shape, or form as to prognosticating the progress or stability of CNV by looking at the pattern of OCT angiography uh, with the CNVs. Um, example of a patient who's been treated with anti of injection over the years, a slight growth in geographic atrophy or atrophy in the macula that allows clear visibility of your CNV. Again, if I just point out this lab in the bottom left-hand corner is in the choriocapillaris layer. So this is sub-RPE network of blood vessels sitting under that area of geographic atrophy. Now, it is important to recognize this because it is quite possible that this network of blood vessels provide nutrition to this remaining functioning photoreceptors. And there's no point treating this if there is no exudative fluid in the area. Similarly, when you see patients with disciform scar, if you were to put them on OCT scanner and do an OCT angiography, you would find they also harbor network of blood vessels within that. But these are the mature blood vessels. They don't leak, don't require any treatment. Um, just a few more cases about non-macular degeneration, non-age-related macular degeneration. And we have those patients in our clinic. Myopic macular degeneration is one such subgroup. Uh, inflammatory CNVs, you have idiopathic and angioid streaks. I've shown you examples already. Here's an example of myopic CNV. Myopic CNVs are difficult to pick up, even with the eye angiography. And I find that OCT angiographies are much better at picking up these changes because it allows you that depth resolved uh, images of your retina and the blood flow. And here is such an example. So the patient had presented with metamorphopsia only. There was a subretinal hyperreflective material. And the slab that goes through the choriocapillary shows you type 1 CNV, which is the commonest type that you see with myopic macular degeneration. Because the patient's visual equity was very good, the patient was managed conservatively because there was no exudation. But you, we had to see the patient quite frequently. And the patient's uh, CNV settled on its own, and the vision remained 6 6. Idiopathic CNV, this usually is described in the younger patients that they present for no obvious reason, no macular degenerative changes, drusen, or anything else, or pigment epithelial changes, and sudden onset of. Uh, distortion or loss of vision, and you find that they have all the classic features of or the biomarkers of wet macular degeneration, and the blood flow pattern shows uh, CNV in the area. Easily picked up on the OCT scan. It's not usual that you would pick up all the CNVs with the OCT. Here is an example of patient with best disease with hemorrhage, exudation. Uh, sub IPE and intraretinal fluid. And because of that dense um, subretinal collection of hyperfluorescent or hyperautofluorescent material, it, which masked both on fluorescent angiography as well as on the OCTA scan. So we could not pick up the network uh, at that stage. So that is to bear in mind that shadowing from uh, material in the inner retina on the vitreous can mask the blood vessels that may still be there in your retina and you cannot pick up on OCTA. Another example, a real example from the clinic recently, a patient presence uh, with metamorphopsia, uh, urgent referral. All you find is there is a subretinal or hyperreflective material. Maybe there is tiny subretinal fluid in this, this area centrally. Um, Another cut, and you can see that maybe there is subretinal fluid. But as I pointed out, what I would like you to pay your attention to is not just the changes that happen in the retina, but they happen in the uh, hyperreflective lines and also in the choroids. If I can point out the choroid here, it's quite deep. 
again, they have got very big outer or bigger choroidal vessels. And if you look at those um, hyperreflective layers, you find that there is a double layer sign in the middle, very shallow pigment epithelial detachment. And the patient has subretinal hyperreflective material, potentially subretinal fluid. And lo and behold, if you do an OCT angiography, you find that network of vessels. Here is a slab uh, that is outer retina or avascular zone. That's the automated slab. But that's spurious because if you put a slab in the choriocapillaries layer, a smaller one, you can just about figure out that there is something going on in this area. And if you just widen that slab to 40 micron, you can pick up those network of blood vessels in your choriocapillaries sub IP space in that area where the shallow pigment epithelial detachment was. So keep an open mind for that subretinal uh, sub IP space. I'll sh show you another example, another useful uh, clue that you can use in clinical practice. This patient who has presented with large pigment epithelial detachment, that is SRAM, subretinal hyperreflective material, subretinal fluid, and intraretinal fluid. But if you see uh, uh, hyperreflectivity within that pigment epithelial detachment, especially on the ceiling of that pigment epithelial detachment, as it is here, it is highly suspicious of a CNV. So when you do an OCT angiography and the flow map tells you exactly where the neovascular complex can be, and that is under the ceiling of that pigment epithelial detachment, as it is here. When you look at the on fast image of that flow, you find that there is a CNV, beautiful CNV. So remember the certain biomarkers uh, I pointed out, looking at the ISOS junction, which is useful for predicting visual outcome. External limiting membrane integrity is useful for, again for predicting visual outcome, but it's the double layer sign, shallow pigment epithelial detachment that you need to be paying attention to because that can be harboring that CNV. Now, this patient was seen five years later. There was no subretinal fluid at the time, but that pigment epithelial detachment has swollen up. You can see the double layer sign quite clearly in the bottom picture. And if you do an OCTA scan, you find the network of blood vessels. So I would say that in conclusion, OCTA is not so new, still new, but not so new, but very promising tool for studying retinal circulation, both for clinical practice as well as for research. It helps us to identify various AMD phenotypes and the disease course of our patients. Of course, there's going to be a learning curve like any other technology, but you shouldn't shy away from using the OCTA in your practice. If you're already using the OCT scans, start paying attention to all those nuances in the biomarkers that we learned about, because that would help you to direct your attention to the right area within the retina to figure out where the CNV can be. Of course, we need to do a lot more studies to learn. It's a quick test. It's non-invasive, patients like it. And it's, it gives you a quick answer, but there are limitations that in certain cases it will not work. There are artifacts that you need to be aware about, aware of, uh, such as the motion artifact with the patient's eye movements. Uh, you can get the pseudo flow pattern. Segmentation artifacts are the commonest error. So make sure that the segmentation lines that you want are in the right area of the retina. When the retinal anatomy is distorted with fluid hemorrhage, the uh, automatic segmentation probably would not work. So if you don't find blood flow where you're expecting blood flow, Go back and check again whether you're looking at the right area of the retina uh, and the right patient and the right method has been used for obtaining OCT angiography. So as a result of our experience, uh, we changed completely how we function in our clinical practice in my macular clinics. So every new patient now gets uh, visual equity OCT and OCTA scan at the baseline along with the clinical examination. If we are in doubt, that's the only time we're using the diet retinal angiography in my clinics. 
For follow-ups, again, it's the same OCT and OCTA that we use. Biangiography is rarely used. So we started a use of OCTA as exploratory um, investigation, and then we found that it complements our existing um, fluorescent angiography. And then learn, learning from that, we have substituted fluorescent angiography with OCTA in almost all the cases as a default. And interestingly, in our practice now, most of our nurses are able to perform OCT angiography. It was started with the medical photographers, but the nurses, the AHCAs, are performing all of our OCT angiography unless it is a challenge with the patient. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farouk. That was absolutely fantastic. We're getting loads of really positive uh, comments and feedback. Everyone just saying how how uh, how relevant it was to clinic clinical practice and how lovely your your images are. And really, I've I've got to second those compliments. Really, I, I think for us um, in the Heidelberg team on the academy side as trainers, it's just so refreshing to listen to a clinician like yourself, uh, Farouk, because you. You just you you properly use the software, um, and as you say, with OCTA there is a, a learning curve for every clinician using this to get to grips with, you know, the controls of of effectively visualizing exactly what what the OCTA is showing showing us. So I, I just it's just so satisfying personally for me to watch you uh, go through all your cases and, and how well you use the software. And actually that that leads me to my first question uh, for you, Farouk, if you don't mind. Um, sure. You mentioned in your paper that you use two slab thicknesses, one being 40 microns and one being 100 microns. Can you um, tell us why you use those specific values and where you'd use them? Okay, um, uh, this was early in our learning experience. Um, we, were, we were trying to figure out what would be the best option for us using in the clinical practice. Ideal would be if Heidelberg can provide us the software that gives us the right slabs in the right position. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, the difficulty with, with the software is when the retinal anatomy is distorted, it, it, your slab lines would be all over the places and you, you need to adjust them manually. And the simplest thing to do would be to look at your outer uh, uh, retinal lines, that is the white line, and we take the basement membrane as the default on which you base your outer retinal slab. Okay, when I say outer retinal, I'm talking about the outer retinal and the choriocapillary slab. So if you just okay. do 40 micron slab, that's just going to capture the area of choriocapillaries on its own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Roughly. It's about 25 microns, but give it some 40 microns, and you're just about picking up the choriocapillaries. But mm -hmm. if you have pigment epithelial detachment, which is higher than 40 microns, it's not going to capture all the flow patterns within that pigment epithelial detachment. And hence we said, now nah, let's just use another marker, another slab, which is wider than that. So you can okay. choose 50, you can choose 100. We chose mm -hmm. 100 because then you can straddle not just only the uh, choriocapillaries, but if you can yes. grow, go above, that's in the outer retina as well. So if yeah. you have a type 1, type 2 C and we combine, it's easier to pick, a, pick it up that way. So 100 microns work better for us because we, had, we were at the learning stage at that time. Yeah. The problem yeah. would be, and I would point out this problem if I may, Tim, is that yeah, if, sure. you, if you use a thicker slab, because it's going to pick up the flow from larger area, you may get overexposure of your on fast image. Just remember that. Okay. Yeah, so what the structural on fast could also be overexposed because you're using a wider segment yeah that makes sense and i think it's a good point because when you do move a slab up and down even if you're using the adaptive segmentation slab it will stop at brooks membrane won't it and you, and the mm -hmm. only way to really go deeper is to make it thicker to visualize that unless of course you use the choreo capillary button and then move that slab up and down that will let you go down through there as well okay yeah so that makes a lot of sense um so what are your thoughts on um, visualizing the flow of the choroid with OCTA? The myth has always been 
that we don't get choroidal flow, or the several theories I've heard about this, we don't get choroidal fl flow because when you've still got an intact choriocapillary layer, that's like absorbing all the light of the OCTA and projecting through the choroid. Do you agree with that, or do you think it's actually the flow of the of the choroidal vessels is, is why we're not picking it up? That, that's the old chestnut, isn't it? The choro choroidal blood flow. And we would love to visualize choroid much better than what we can. And I think that, that there are certain drawbacks here. The, the pigment epithelium is, is, is the main one uh, because that's highly reflective and that's, that's where most of the light is bounced back. Then yeah. the choriocapillaries, as you say, you can visualize choriocapillaries fairly well. But deeper than that, when you go out to the outer choroid, there's very little light reaching that. And quite mm. often this, what you see is kind of empty or black vessels uh, mm. in the outer choroid as a result, because the light is not reaching that. And it's the internal reflectivity as well. Some people yeah. say that contributes to that, internal oh. reflectivity within the choroid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, right, okay. So we're, I'm on the right path with my thinking behind that. So you've confirmed that, that's great. So I've got a, a good question here. This is about uh, fluid quantification. Um, and this person asks, um, when it comes outside of clinical trials, how important is it to know the quantity of fluid or in the clinic, is it just a simple question of, is there fluid or isn't there fluid? What do you think about that? It's a, it's a combination of all those things. I think the clinical trials initially, as I said, they were looking at the rectal thickness, central rectal thickness, and mm. the central focal thickness, whichever way it was defined. So you were just taking one measure in one part of the retina Yes, it worked in, in getting the licenses and whatnot. But however, it does not help in our clinical practice if you want to tailor your treatment for that individual patient of the eye. So you need yeah. to factor in uh, all the compartments of fluid. And there are various papers on that now. So you can look at the cumulative volume of fluid in all the mm -hmm. three compartments, or you can look at each compartment uh, individually. What is consistently been, been, been shown is that the intraretinal fluid compartment is the worst for the uh, visual outcome. So most mm -hmm. of us would want to have drier intraretinal fluid. There are some of us who would say you want to have completely dry macula, which mm -hmm. is utopia. It's possible mm -hmm. in some cases, but impossible in all the cases. So what, what people try to do and achieve is to have the minimal uh, fluid that is possible with maximum treatment and use that as a baseline. There is another aspect to the fluid, and some people feel that the subretinal fluid, leaving some subretinal fluid, is not detrimental to the visual function. In fact, in some cases, it may be beneficial to leave some fluid as well. But the jury is out on that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. So um, this is actually a question that you did refer to this um, kind of the first part of, of your presentation. Actually, you did, um, I noticed there was a word right at the end there, and I'm sure you, you know this, um, this abbreviation, but it's, it's called SPIM for suspended scattered particles in motion. Um, you did mention at the end, I saw the word turbid fluid in there, and I've heard some clinicians describe this appearance with OCTA is when we're picking up this turbid movement, of this Brownian motion of cells within a more dense intraretinal fluid often. And my question about this, is do you think SPIM is a useful biomarker for, for AMD or other retinal disease, or is it a kind of artifact with OCTA? What do you think? But again, I think, I think we have some early experience on that, but we need to collect more data to figure out how it tallies with the outcomes. Um, mm. So potentially it, it is a biomarker that we can use, but, but we, need to, we need to look at it in more detail at the moment. Yeah. Yes, because at the moment, I think there's only two papers I've actually seen about SPIM specifically. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's a good message, actually, for anyone out there is to, to uh, delve into that deeper in the future. Um, so I think in terms of the fluid quantification thing, do you think quantification of, of the vessel density, for example, do you think that's a useful clinical tool or do you think it's enough using OCTA the way you use it, where you, you just analyze that yourself as a clinician and, and review that? Would it help having that quantification in your practice? 
I think it's a very good question. I, I think uh, the other uh, OCT uh, OCT uh, platforms uh, have that feature. Mm. Unfortunately, I haven't got that with the Heidelberg at the moment, but certainly it would be useful, especially if you're going to go and uh, look at the automation of the images, uh, machine learning and whatnot. I think mm -hmm. it would be very helpful. At the okay. moment, we are using just the qualitative uh, yes. measures in the clinical practice, but having mm -hmm. that quantitative data to back it up it certainly would be helpful. Okay, yeah, so it is just a, an added thing with having the, some numbers on your side as well. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an actually a, a treatment specific question here, and it just asks that, um, do you treat uh, RAP lesions differently to the way you would treat a type one or type two MNV or CMV, I should say? Uh, from the treatment choice point of view, you know, the patients still get the anti-VEGF um, right. injections. Uh, just the same protocol is, uh, is followed. And again, there is quite a bit of variability in how the patients or the eyes respond to the anti-VEGF. Some eyes respond really well. One slightly assuring, reassuring thing about the RAPS is that visual loss, uh, progression of visual loss is relatively slower with the RAP lesions compared to the type two CNVs that we see. Right, thank you. Um, and I think I've got time for one more question while I've got you, I want to take advantage of this moment. Um, sure. So in the future, do you think Doppler OCT will be, is it something that will, is that, do you think that's the next generation for OCTA? Is that the next sort, is that the, yeah, is that is that gonna be an amazing, evolution of this technology or, or do you think it's, it's it's information we don't really need to know what do you think about Doppler? I, I, I think it's nice to have an additional technology available to us um, I'll reserve my judgment whether it's going to be better or not the way things are progressing with the OCT with the higher and higher definition images that we're seeing I think it would be difficult to beat the technology as it is now but yeah. I would keep an open mind and look out for that technology to appear on our, our uh, doorsteps in the clinics up and down the country. But I think we would have to re relearn using that technology that would, there's going to be a learning curve for that as well. Yeah, brilliant. And um, actually, finally, um, is it a question actually, it's, it may be a hint if you've not thought of trying this already, I'm, I'm sure you have. Have you had a go at enabling EDI when you do OCTA? Have you tried that? We, we, we tried, uh, but we felt that the EDI um, was already built in with the OCT module 2, OCT2. Mm -hmm. but, but yes, we haven't tried it, but not often enough. Okay. What, what would you suggest as the te technology expert? <laughs> Yeah, well, I must admit, I'm a big advocate of it because from 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 my point of view, where oh. are we focusing with with AMD? OK, I think it is actually a pathology specific technology to use, to be completely honest. I think with AMD, of course, we're always focused in the subretinal space, aren't we? And if you can increase Correct. the signal down there with EDI, then I just see EDI as actually just, I don't see it being anything else other than beneficial with AMD patients, because especially if there's intraretinal or, or subretinal fluid or even hyperreflective membranes over the top of the neovascularization, just by enhancing the signal down there with EDI, surely that's just gonna allow you to see membranes easier. That's, that's what I generally advise clinicians when I'm talking about this. Um, and I think, I suppose, if you're using OCTA on the opposite side, where you're looking for areas of ischemia on the surface of the retina, and then maybe that's when you would disable EDI to be able to give you the the, the more correct segmentation and flow of the of the superficial and deep vascular complexes. But yeah, that's the that's the advice I I tend to hand out. So I I hope you agree with me on that, on uh, and maybe give it a try using uh, EDI a bit more. I'd be interested to hear you. Your feedback on that. Oh, oh, okay. certainly. Certainly. Sorry. Yes, great. Um, well, I think that's that's all we got time for. We've we've still got a a great amount of um people still hanging on just for the end here for route. We uh we capped out just over around 250 people this evening. You might like to know because I know it's always tricky with these things if you know how big your audience is that you're talking to. So really fantastic numbers. Um, everyone stayed right through to the end for all these questions as well. 
So um, yeah, I just want to once again thank you for your for your time with us this e this evening, Prof. Thanks for answering all the questions. Um, those of you that um, are still here, um, I'm sorry I couldn't get around to all your questions. If you do have anything pressing though, you can email us at the academy. You've got all the details for that. Emily's just going to pop up finally with a few things to say as well. But thank you from my end, and thank you for it. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Farouk. It was a really good presentation. Thank you very much.